just a normal London swimming pool. But join us later as a crocodile is released live on Park Date. It's an introduction to Park Date. It's an introduction to Park Date. It's an introduction to Park Date that I'm singing, but not for long. Oh, you just caught me uh, recording an introduction to Park Date. Uh, just stick it up there, it'll be fine. Okay, on today's episode, we have someone very, very interesting. It is somebody who, uh, well, can you guess? I'm going to read this out from his LinkedIn. He's going to be furious about this. He's an enthusiastic, creative and friendly biology graduate with five years of varied experience in customer service, radio production and the leisure industry. Who could it be? Yes, it's Philip Kostoletsky. Uh, Philip talked to me at Abney Park Cemetery, Stoke Newington. We looked at some graves we petted some dogs and we talked about some of the comedy greats from years gone by. Thank you for your time, Philip. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this chat. And uh, if you like park dates, please leave us a review. You can say you hate it. I don't care. But just leave us a review. And uh, follow us on social at Park Date Podcast. My new comedy feed is at Christopher Beanland Comedy on Instagram parkdate.co.uk is the website enjoy this episode okay welcome to Abney Park Cemetery in Stoke Newington it's a park full of graves and I'm here with Philip Kostoletsky. Hello, hello. Hi, Philip. I'm good. How are you doing, Chris? I'm good. Wie geht's dir? Wie geht's dir? Alles gut und dir? Uh, gut, danke. <laughs> Wonderful. I appreciate the effort of uh, putting in a couple of German words in there. My German is so bad. Yeah. This um, is, uh, this it's is, a hard language to learn, though. It is a very hard language. I was raised, I was lucky mm-hmm. that I was raised bilingual, so I didn't have to so fully learn it. But then yeah. I kind of lost it, and so I had to learn it again. Yeah. So I do sort of know the challenges. Um, thank you for taking me out on this date. And yeah. this, you say <laughs> Park Cemetery. I think it's more Cemetery Park, I'll be honest. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's so romantic. Yeah. Oh, my God. Are you, are you feeling a bit skeptical about the whole thing? No. Even, even I'm starting to question myself. But I sort, of, I sort of have the plan in my mind. But you must be like, well, why are we walking through this graveyard? Um, I don't mind it, actually. It, I think there's something that's kind of romantic about it. Is, the, it. is it meant to be like an actual date? Or is it just like called a park date podcast for a bit of fun? Oh, yeah. It's an actual date, yeah. Oh, we right. have to, you know, you things, gotta, ha- things have to happen yeah, after. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I basically talked to you for 30 minutes and then... Uh, we know well, what we'll, see, we'll see what happens. Yeah, exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. Then I get the Patreon <laughs> exclusive. Is that what you call it? Yeah, it depends. Sorry, I got to tell my shoe Depends list. what level you sign up to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, also, now I'm thinking, is it suitable for us to be talking in a graveyard? I think it's okay, isn't it? Yeah, I don't think there's any, like... Is that a thing? Is that a superstition here in the UK? I, I think it's okay. I think yeah. it's okay. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just, like, double, double thinking. Actually, I did, a, I did one with Mark Thomas in a kind of similar place, but there was more space. Yeah. It was less spooky and less yeah. threatening. <laughs> It is. Uh, um, this yeah, one. this looks very much like a scene in Harry Potter where one of the auxiliary characters dies. It does look like that, exactly. Are you a, are you a uh, Harry Potter fan? No, I think, I don't know why it was in my head. I think I've been playing the game recently. Yeah. Um, uh, the uh, the boycotted game or whatever. I don't know if you're, if yeah, you're, if you're not meant yes. to play it, but I've been playing it a little yes. bit. A few months ago, I was actually, I was playing a few months ago, and then I remembered it today, and I, so I think that's why it was in my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is a bit spooky, but I kind of like it. Yeah, yeah. It, is, it was quite interesting, and you can see, actually, one of the things about this graveyard, I feel a bit like a tour guide now, but it's interesting because it's kind of a non-conformist graveyard so okay i think people who were like radicals and liberals and people like outside the establishment oh i kind see of buried here yeah those, those people outside the establishment paid like a couple <laughs> couple grand <laughs> was, to here's, have a huge here's one, this here's one, one, one with a lion. lion on it this is a huge lion yeah um yeah i don't uh, i don't think this person <laughs> was completely outside the establishment <laughs> exactly um, it's quite uh, quite an ostentatious 
Uh, uh, great. Do you want to look at it properly? Well, let's have a look at it. I think this this would be. Um, I, I was thinking maybe they should just plant a tree when I died, but actually now thinking about it, I think I would like a, a big lion. a big sleeping lion on top of my grave. I think that would be a good. In uh, ever loving memory of Frank C. Bostock, born mm-hmm. September tenth, eighteen sixty six, died October eighth, nineteen twelve. On that happy Easter morning, all the graves their dead restore. Father, sister, child, and mother meet once more. I didn't. Uh, I didn't enunciate that with any of the rhythm that it was meant to <laughs> I be. I think you did a good job. I, no, it. no, no, no. I don't think I did, but I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, it's the family grave. Yeah, the whole family. It's only the two of them, probably stacked on top of each other. Yeah, I think I would probably prefer to not have to spend eternity with my family. Yeah. I love. I love them, but <laughs> maybe they can have their grave. And maybe I'll just have one a yeah. little, a, a little it, distance away. It's interesting, isn't it? Peace. I, I, you know, the thing about a family grave is you can put all your other family members in there and you could be like, don't bury me there, but you don't actually get to choose. So like, someone could just totally <laughs> you never know. you over. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You'd never know, would you? Do you believe in the afterlife? Oh, wow. That's... Uh, we're getting oh, is this not an appropriate place we, to no, ask? No, <laughs> we're, we're getting on to big questions. Um, I don't know about that one. I'm not sure if I do, yeah. but I'm kind of interest I, well, since i was a kid i was always interested in ghosts mm-hmm. Is that and here? i was oh. I, I loved reading ghost stories yeah here's like the chapel thing i i love the idea of ghosts and i do wonder if yeah do you think ghosts exist i don't know i get some spooks every once in a while so, weird things happen sometimes some stuff does they? happen i've never yeah. had like a like a like a godly experience i've had a few moments where i've like felt a, certainly an otherly presence mm. but i don't think anything godly um what about we- you are you uh do I believe in an afterlife? Yeah. I don't know. I, I sort of don't invest a lot of time into thinking about it. Mm. Uh, which, yeah, I just sort of, I think if someone, if there was evidence, I'd believe it. But if there isn't, I'm just kind of neutral. Yeah. Um, yeah, we can't really enter this, but this is some, a nice uh, little church area. Yeah, construction work on the, it, it's, yeah, kind of like a church. It looks like a church with, like, no windows in the middle of the yeah. graveyard. Do you want to try to sneak in, or are you not that inclined? We could, what, should we climb over the fence? What that we can we climb could over do. the fence? Oh, there's more of this stinging nettle here. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, we can. It's done a pretty good job. Here. Yeah. We'd have to properly climb over it. <laughs> um, well, we've had a look anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, hopefully this is uh, educational mm. as well as uh, <laughs> recreational. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah Odyssey. Um, okay, let's go. We need to not get too lost. <laughs> Otherwise, I have a feeling they close it. Quite soon. Oh, do you think so? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> so, they, they probably close at six. A lot yeah, exactly. Earliest. We'll be uh, we'll we'll be out by uh, we'll be out by then. Um. So well, yeah, we've uh, we've tackled all the big yeah. big topic. Any other any other big questions you want to uh, want to talk about? No, not nothing really. <laughs> I mean, you know, just sort of. Do you do you Space. play the game like look for the oldest tombstone? Do you know that game? No. So you go in a um. You go in a graveyard and you try to find the oldest tombstone. Ah. The problem is the really old ones obviously are all faded and stuff like this. But you know what this is? This is more like a graveyard. Everything's overgrown. Mm. Like it's not maintained. So maybe that's the radical aspect of it. Yeah. Is is it... Um, yeah, I can't tell if this was a park first or a cemetery first. I think it was made as a cemetery. Oh. But it's, yeah, become kind of overgrown. Yeah. And sort of, yeah, it makes it more gothic, doesn't it? With all the... So goth. All of the <laughs> this is so good. <laughs> it's, it's That's exactly. so hardcore, dude. <laughs> I want to be buried in a place where no one will see my grave. <laughs> <laughs> it's so goth that the Cure could play. Yeah, uh, could play here. Have you ever been to um, Highgate Cemetery where you can see Karl Marx's? I think big I have. Head yeah, 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 yeah. On his grave. I don't think I don't remember that one. Is that near a football stadium? Mm, yeah. Yeah, I saw the one where they. Um, my mother was like, she's really into like art history and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So we went there once. Yeah. And. Uh, she like uh, they were talking about how there was the Chelsea football like not Chelsea football the guy who's like created the football team that's at that stadium I'm not mm-hmm. really into football you can tell how, <laughs> that by how I phrase this he like the guy he's he, a very he, Ted Lasso <laughs> yeah, yeah, like yeah, a, yeah a ball <laughs> yeah like a you know the head of a football team <laughs> uh, he is apparently actually gra- buried in that mm. graveyard but none of the fans really know it and so a lot of times they just walk by without thinking about it they don't know um, but yeah. yeah there's a few famous people buried there yeah but are they total radicals like these guys <laughs> I don't think so bro <laughs> who knows who knows um, so your sport uh, one of one of your sports was more than football, Philip. Was swimming, wasn't it? Yeah. I'm sta- I'm stood here with a former former lifeguard, 
and swim swim coach. How do you, how do you know this about me? I did my research. That's but a, no, but this is this is um oh, there's a dog on its own. I was yeah, oh. I swam growing up. Uh, my mother was a swimmer. Well, one of the reasons this appealed to me, uh, Philip, is I love swimming as well. Do you? And I go swimming every day. Nice. Uh, I love the Lido um, in London Fields. Don't know if you know it. No, I don't know it, no. It's very, very, very nice. Yes. Um, but yeah, I think swimming is, uh, is a great, great thing. Great for your mind and body, right? Yeah. Are, yeah. You, are you still a swimmer? Uh, was, was there so much swimming that you've given up now? I've been, I've been known to swim on occasion. <laughs> um, I, um, so I, sw- I swam a lot growing up because obviously my mother pushed it. And then I did it at university. And then I tried to keep, when I was a lifeguard, I was lucky that we had like a gym membership. Mm. I mean, the job was horrendous, so we got like a free gym membership. Is it a bad job? Oh my God, lifeguarding is one of the worst jobs ever. Really? Yeah, I mean, not one of the worst jobs ever. I mean, I'm sure that like, you know, oil, oil miners and stuff like this will be listening going, oh, I'm so sorry. But it's like, it's it's just mind bogglingly dumb Mm. and, and not dull, I mean. Because you just sit there and you look at it and nothing happens. Yeah. And so when I was working, we did like an hour and a half on shift, 15 minute break, hour and a half back right. on. Right. And it's just so like nothing's, you're not achieving anything. You're not yeah. doing anything. You're just taking these like chlorine levels. And the worst part of it was we had a problem once with our air filtration system mm-hmm. in that uh, the chlorine fumes weren't filtering out. And so my eyes started like burning. Uh, oh the shit. Chlorine fumes. Yeah, 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 <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, like painfully so. Yeah. And I went, like, we had this uh, one of the building managers, Lucas, who was from Lithuania, who was really nice. It's only relevant because of the, what he says afterwards. Mm-hmm. I told him, I said, like, you know, dude, dude, my eyes are literally burning here. Is there anything we can do? Right. And he just went, you know, Philip, sometimes your eyes are just going to burn. <laughs> <laughs> and it just felt like some sort of old Lithuanian proverb, right. <laughs> like about getting through the tough times. Um, but then he was—he was—he was, he said that stuff like that, and he also went, "No, no, no, it's okay. We'll work together. We'll, we'll, we'll get this going." So he actually did help out. Right. He was a really interesting guy because he like did this job, but then he also like had a wife back home. Yeah. He was like supporting, and he worked in like uh, data mining, and he just had all these things going for him. And he was also really like—he was the first guy I ever met who I think came from, like. He came from like a, 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 a background of criminality, I think. He never fully right. said it, but he suggested it. But he kind of realized it was wrong. And he even it was the first person ever I met in my life who said, you know, I grew up with a group of boys. None of us had fathers. And so we turned to that and I needed right. to get out of it. And I just thought, how fascinating is that? Yeah. Right? That, that, that this guy is now here working with, you know, working. And I'm able to chat with him. And it was also interesting for me because I also didn't grow up with a father figure, you know, mm-hmm. after year, year nine of my life. And... Um, which is not how a human being would say that sentence. After year nine of my life, I grew up without a father figure. Uh, no, so uh, my parents lickety split when I was nine. Yeah. And, uh, well, father, anyway. Um, and so kind of, it was. it's always been rare when I've met other like older men or men who- Who haven't had that. Who haven't had that and then figure. address it so like right. frankly. And right, it's right. like, it's for me, it's like a real like, oh, okay, very, very interesting. Yeah. Which relates to your Edinburgh show? Doesn't a it? little bit, yeah. I mean, the show. So the show is called Daddy's Home. Daddy's Home. Yeah. And, and um, I love it when Philip told me the name of the show. I'd forgotten it. You do it with a wry smile. Yeah. And a little wink. Yeah. Uh, which is a very good way of announcing it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, um, it's very <laughs> stupid. I mean, the title. Like when I thought of it, I thought this is so stupid. And a lot of my friends were like, "Oh, you should be worried about calling it that because you might get like connotations of like." people thinking like you're you know you're gay or something like that and then like that's not an issue for me because i'm not but it, who cares if you know mm-hmm. if somebody goes to that show thinking that and they buy that ticket no, i'm not going to be fussed yeah for it but you, I also, you'll, you'll do what needs to be done yeah, i'll do what needs to be done to sell those <laughs> just, tickets just back. like after this podcast <laughs> i'm a hustler it needs to be done oh no, it, needs no. To, it needs to be done no not in the graveyards <laughs> please um no so there was like worries about that and stuff but right. I, I, every time i say it like people laugh at it because they yeah. just think it's so stupid and like it is very tongue-in-cheek yeah i think the show is loosely about that but if oh sorry just yeah. walk <laughs> there's, a, dog poo. there's a very very strong aroma which is just absolutely molested <laughs> my nose yeah that's horrible wow, that's fun i've never heard of somebody use that in an expression <laughs> that a smell could molest your nose it was so bad wasn't it it was very very bad um do you think your nose is going to show up in court and be like <laughs> this is where yes. the smell touched me exactly. Ugh, edit that please um <laughs> uh, what was i saying yeah so it's kind of about that a little bit i don't know i'm, I'm not it, really you, you need I, I think with edinburgh shows you need like this jumping off point don't you like yeah. here's an idea but then actually yeah so for me i'm not really like about. i don't really come from a background of like loving these edinburgh fringe style shows i watched a lot of american stand-up growing up mm-hmm. and so for me that's oh doggy's fighting fine. dogs oh, that's a very cute dog <laughs> Little guy. Um, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, I sort of, I prefer the more, what you'd say, or the kind of traditional American style. Who were your shows. heroes, Philip, when you were younger? Heroes. Um, some of them are cancelled, just mm-hmm. letting you know, but they still obviously maintain as my heroes, um, with that caveat. Uh, so, Bill Burr, Conan O'Brien, Louis C.K., Dave Chappelle, yeah. for certain, or, and Sean Locke, um, mm-hmm. are certainly like five acts who I just thought were like just phenomenal. Bill yeah. Burr recently has really kind of become that kind of uh, hero again in a lot of ways. Yeah. I just think he's, yeah, I just think he's one of the best. It's just so natural and free. Although I'm rewatching some Dave Chappelle now, which has been good. Richard Pryor, I watched his special recently for yeah. the first time. And like, have you ever seen any of his stuff? Yeah, it's really, really it's, good. It's sensational. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's like so good and it's unbelievable how good it is. Have you seen I'm Dying Up Here? It's no. a show about uh, comedians in LA in the 70s, yeah. which no one seems to have seen. It's very, very that good. Down in my notes. Yeah, I'm dying up here. Uh, it's this group of like wannabe stand up comedians who form this sort of community. Uh, they're all very damaged. It kind of shows how often quite damaged yeah. comedians are. Like, there's often a lot going on behind the scenes. Um, but Richard Pryor is one of the people who appear in that show so there's a lot of like oh wow that's fascinating yeah there's a lot of like people from that era who are kind of celebrated oh, that's amazing um, yeah, and so yeah Richard Pryor was uh, yeah. I remember liking him when I was a kid actually I, yeah, I was like he has just he's really like and it just feels like he's talking that's yeah. the biggest thing It's and he just and it's so heartfelt and like I mean he t- I don't know if you've seen he has this joke about how he says that his dad died while he was having sex <laughs> like his dad died in the middle of having sex with a woman and he tells a little story and then he just throws out this incredible one that he goes, he came and went. <laughs> and, and it's just like, just fuck, dude. How do you do that? How do you have like all of this like, yeah, yeah. like physicality, personality and like uh, warmth. And then on top of that, just throw in like an absolutely slick one liner yeah. in the mix there. Um, so, yeah, yeah, they're really good. But then like I'm getting into like some of the more contemporary standups. People like Michelle Wolf, I think are phenomenal. And um there's a lot of like UK based ones that I've gotten into. So people like Mickey Overman, Sean McLaughlin, people like that are really yeah. good. So um, you were saying that um, maybe t- some typical Edinburgh fringe shows yeah. don't appeal to you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what kind of thing are you then trying to craft for this show? Just, uh, I think the word is a masterpiece. <laughs> 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 Definitely, Philip, the most modest guest <laughs> we've ever had on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, don't, I don't know because I'm kind of in a I'm kind of in a weird state now, writing it like mm. do, you know, putting all the bits of the show together. Because I've tried to do like something heartfelt at the end, and I just sort of I just doesn't feel natural to me. Yeah, I'd much rather make up. A... Actually, should we sit for a minute? Yeah, we can sit yeah. for a minute. Um, I'd much rather. How do we sit so that the mic catches me? Just here would be perfect. Oh, I'll scooch my boots. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, oh, a little doggy. He didn't want to pet there's me. So many, <laughs> there's so um, many dogs here. I think, yeah, I, th- I think it's, I'm finding really challenging is, is, is the, the pressure to do a serious point in a show. Mm. Feels like a lot, whereas I really just want it to be really funny and I just want people to go away and feel happy and feel good. Yeah. And I'm not saying that I don't challenge the audience in some ways. I certainly say stu- some stuff. I'm not gonna, I'm in no way an edgy comedian because I have no ambition to make the audience feel like shit about themselves. Yeah. Although I think a really good edgy comedian, the whole point of it is is to actually challenge, but make people laugh from being challenged. So in that sense, I try to do some stuff that's a bit more on the line. But a lot of it's just very fun, very silly, um, like, and I try to do a little bit of social commentary in there, but I just want it to be a really funny hour of material. Yeah, and I think it's really important for comedy to be funny. Yeah. And I love watching things which are funny. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's, it's good that we have a space where people... I'm trying to be diplomatic here. People can express themselves. While not being funny. <laughs> While not being right. Like, people have points to make, and I get that, yeah. and they should be allowed to make those points, absolutely. And a lot of people enjoy that. Yeah, um, they're, but they're, that being but said, I love are, jokes. I love yeah, laughs, yeah, yeah. right? I think they're great. I think that, um, look at this dog, how the way it walks. It's, it's like, very good. Well, you said you like corgis. That's kind of like yeah, corgi like, isn't it? You know, yeah. I don't want to shit on it all, because there are some shows I've seen, like, that are, like, like Rothaniel by uh, Jared Jared Carmichael, I think mm. that's how you pronounce it. His is just, he just does something really interesting. But I think it's more, and I, I watched this show recently where I thought it was a really good show, but it didn't feel, it felt like it had lost some of the magic of stand up to me because it felt too um, formulaic. It felt, mm. not formulaic, but it was maybe the one the word. It felt very like prepared. Like there were, at the end, there were like 18 callbacks, and then there were like references, and then every time they started a story, 
like it, they would basically have a, they have a story throughout the show and then they just do a bit of stand up basically like a, a club routine and then go back into the story and yeah. then go to a bit of stand up and back into the story and I was watching and I thought like this is really good and it's very well structured but it doesn't actually feel like the kind of it doesn't feel like somebody's just talking to me and I can never get lost in the bits because every time that happens I get reminded oh I'm watching a show and what I like about stand up is for it just to feel like somebody's just talking on stage and you know and even though I know it's prepared to still get the magic of it mm -hmm. I think that's why someone like Eddie Pepitone I think it's how you pronounce Eddie Pepitone mm -hmm. he's really good because he like he does this thing where he starts really quiet and then just starts screaming in the middle of a bit and then he takes it quiet again and you watch and you go I forgot that he was quiet at the start of this bit and now yeah. he's just tricked me again and he does it again and again and again and he just tricks you every time into thinking he's quiet and then he screams and, and then he gets quiet again he's like the mogwai of comedy there's quiet yeah. bits loud bits yeah yeah, yeah. so I yeah. think he's really good but I also feel like oh <laughs> <laughs> that, that noise was a tennis ball bouncing off a bin. Yeah. Uh, that's good. Yeah, 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 that's <laughs> pretty, pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, um, so, so yeah, I, I think I'm trying to go for something that's really fun, but if, if I can get a little part or maybe like anything kind of smart in there that maybe proves a bit of a point. Mm. If anything, the point I'm, I think I'm trying to make is just a little bit to talk about the loneliness I feel at times, because I think that's very relatable to people. Mm -hmm. And then to talk about how I've kind of... I kind of want to just just be happy. I think that's really it. And I don't want to be upset about like, you know, my father leaving and then eventually dying when I was younger was really tough on me. But one of the things I've really started to realize recently is how much my mother was there. And it, I almost feel I almost feel stupid writing a show or trying to write bits about how much I miss my dad or how much that didn't mean to me because like I had my mom the whole time and she's been literally there like, yeah. dude, and like been under way more pressure than I could ever imagine. So I kind of like, so it's like a, partly homage yeah if anything I'd, mom, I'd yeah. say I'd say what I'd want the show to be the hour if I can get anything out of it emotional outside of the actual bits is I want it to kind of be in memory of my father but dedicated yeah. to my mother in a moms are so great I mean that's that's all that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's okay well I have no idea unfortunately <laughs> so okay but moms are really great yeah I mean moms if only really my mother great. died then I, that would be a really great story <laughs> you know yeah. Then I could call mommy's home and that'd be really weird. <laughs> that could be the follow up. Yeah, you yeah. Just kill your mother. Just and kill my you, mother. You do that next year. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. It'd be perfect. Um, so I think, yeah, if anything, are you, are, the tagline for the show, I say, it's about love, family, and pancakes. <laughs> right. Yeah, because it's a bit about, I think it's mainly about how, like, people, you know, I say the show's not about anything, and here I am talking about everything. It's about, yeah, I think it's about, like, kind of feeling a bit lonely, mm -hmm. trying to figure out, like, what makes a person who they are, but then ultimately just being happy with yourself. Yeah. I, think, I think if that's the message I can get across, that'd be great. Um, but I'll probably just try to do bits that have those ideas in there rather yeah. than, you know, at the 50 minute mark go, and that's why my father <laughs> leaving was so tough. And it feels just rehearsed and stuff. Do you so. think with comedy there is that therapeutic element? Yeah. You know, I, the show we were talking about, I'm dying up here, you yeah. kind of see this pain that a lot of comedians are in. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Like when you see a lot of shows, it's like issues are being worked through. Yeah. Comedians are often depressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there, there is that kind of therapeutic element, isn't 100%. there? There's the working through of stuff. But then I think there's also the aspect that audiences can relate yeah. to these stories that are being told, right? Yeah. Like you can see people come to your show, they might have had similar experiences. Yeah, 100%. And those things are going to talk to them, right? So I think it's therapeutic in two ways for me. Um, first of all, you, I think the audience is one of the big parts of it, and, and that again in two ways. So one of it, it's really nice to hear an audience just come up to you and say, "I've had a really shit week, and what you've done has really made me feel better." Because mm -hmm. I've had that happen a few times, and I've just gone like, "Wow, that's incredible!" That mm -hmm. like somebody said to me, "I was having a horrible week, and you've made me feel better, yeah. and I'm gonna." It was the, ever the other way around. That. I was having a great week. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was having a great week. Yeah, I get to see you, Philip. Yeah, yeah, it's, now it's fucking horrible. Jokes about your dead <laughs> father horrible. depressed me. Um, <laughs> no, 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 I've never had that. And then the yeah. other way, it's it's because of the relatableness. Is you're talking about something that you maybe think is a weird concept or you feel alone about, and then they relate to that. And the other way, I think it's therapeutic, is in that it's basically taking like a lot of like I think my core bits and the ones that I think are the strongest. They come from a frustration, either at feeling like. Uh, um, how do you say like un, what do you call it when like you're not in the same not in sync with the world I can't mm -hmm. think of the phrase for it yeah. at, at ends with the world is yeah. that something like that yeah so you're in different positions it just feels like I'm missing something and I don't know why this is bothering me so it comes from that kind of frustration and to then say that opinion out loud and then people go no 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 you're right that is something that bothers me as well or that is something I relate to that's where it can feel incredibly um, incredibly comforting and to, to, um, to be able to take things that annoy you and then make like a product out of it, that feels incredibly satisfying. And I was talking to a friend of mine recently and 
I was saying like, essentially I was feeling like, I did one on a few dates with somebody and then they weren't interested in me and it really upset me, but I got, I mean, like, like, you know, I got over it in a week and a bit. Did the, you get feedback about why? Um, they just said they weren't, they just said I'm not feeling it anymore romantically. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, I just, it was like, yeah, cool, fair enough. And they're like, thanks for being so nice about it. And then I was like <laughs> depressed for a week and a half. And I was like, I'm totally cool about it. <laughs> right, but the thing was, I had that feeling and then I sort of started thinking about like, well, why, why mm -hmm. was I not myself when I was on these dates? Why was I like, why did I feel intimidated by them? I started to explore this a little bit and it all came from the fact that I felt like I don't have my life together right. and I felt like she I mean this may not be true at all and it doesn't really matter because the jokes are written now um, but I kind of sort of felt like she looked at me and didn't feel like I had my life together and so now I've written a whole bit about how I think you should actually date guys who don't have their life together <laughs> because it's way more fun <laughs> and it's way more interesting and one of the lines I have is something along the lines of um you know, it's easy to date a success who loves you. What about a failure that needs you? you know? <laughs> and so I'm trying to basically write, like, it came from that frustration, but it also kind of is this. And I was telling my friend, like, oh, it's, you know, I had these feelings, but now I've written this stuff out of it, and it feels so nice. And he's a comedian as well, and he said, yeah, man, it must be so horrible. Like, what do normal people do when they have these thoughts and these feelings, and they, and they get over stuff? What do they do with that knowledge? Because, like, they don't even get jokes at the end of it. Things happen. Yeah. And then as a comedian, you can deal with it. Right, it's like, here's a way to and, and that's the thing I've always found is no matter what's happened in my life, no matter, even in comedy when I feel upset, mm -hmm. as long as I'm writing, as long as I'm working on material, that'll, um, I always say that, I always say, and I say this to, I'm not, like, I've only been going about five years, but there's still comedians who are younger than me, um, both in age and experience, and I always say, like, the, the material will set you free. Like, that's the biggest thing that'll just ease you of your pain. Yeah. Because if you're feeling upset that no one's booking you, write material. If you feel upset that the gigs aren't going well, you can write if things you out of your control, but you can always control that you're working on stuff. It's so, it's so ambitious and hopeful comedy. That's yeah. what I love about it. Yeah, it's like any creative undertaking, isn't it? There's yeah. so much that you're not able to control, yeah. right? You're, wait, you're kind of waiting yeah. for these fairy godfathers or fairy godmothers to come along yeah, yeah. and anoint you. Yeah, yeah. Here is your chance to be on TV or here is your yeah. contract to write a book or something. Yeah, yeah. And you're kind of waiting for those like those gatekeepers I guess are less important now like you can especially go with and, online and right stuff like exactly that. Like yeah. you make videos yeah. and a lot of a lot of comedians and Put stuff you, online yeah, 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 yeah exactly. it's, it's People, the best part musicians of it as well, I think that's like, why stand-up is so much better than than acting because acting you really are waiting for these gatekeepers mm -hmm. if you want to reach the top levels but as a stand-up I mean you could put your own clips online you could put your shows online yeah. it's all there it's super ambitious and I like, like your videos with Ali Woods thank you yeah, yeah the sketches funny. yeah yeah he's yeah, very yeah. very good he's a really like he's really clean at getting little jokes in there and just like cutting stuff down like he'll just take a video that has been like two minutes long and he just goes get rid of this mm -hmm. chop it down uh, and he'll clean it up uh, he's ginger though, so that's the only. <laughs> you can't have everything. Yeah, you can't have everything, man. No, he's no. very, he's very, uh, you, like you recognize him instantly, don't you? I, yeah. was, I was at an Edinburgh show last year, and I was like, oh, that's Ali Woods, that like, guy. Off the internet. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so it's good. Yeah, I, lo I love, I love, I love stuff. Did you ever do? Did you ever do stand up or comedy? Yeah, so I've written a lot. Oh, uh, a writer. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Should tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> I've just mimed a pipe a for pipe. any of the listeners <laughs> coming in. <laughs> A pipe in the graveyard, yes. <laughs> well, this is what I like to do on a Sunday, yeah, yeah. a pipe in the graveyard. Oh, I know um, what you're saying, buddy. Uh, <laughs> Whoa, man, the graves are talking to me, bro. <laughs> well, I've come, I've, come to, I've come to comedy performance later in life. Yeah. So I've started doing stand-up um, as I've got older. Mm. Um, and a, a lot of that was through... Well, I was talking to um, Liz uh, Guterbock about this. When I'd done... Uh, like s books that weren't always funny, like more serious books. I would do book talks, and they would be like me trying to do a stand-up gig. Yeah. Where I would do jokes, yeah, yeah, yeah. and obviously no one would laugh because they're not there to laugh. Yeah, they're yeah. just a lot of very nice. Like I love love my readers. Very nice older people yeah. who are very serious, and I would do material that would not get laughs. And I then I was thinking, well, actually, I should be doing this material to people who have come to a venue specifically to laugh yes. at a comedy show. Yeah. And actually, when you do jokes yeah. and when you perform comedy, yeah. you get a kind of... It's hard to describe for people that don't know it, but it's a rush oh my God, that you could high. probably put on a level with... Not that I've ever taken drugs in my life. Of course. <laughs> I'm sure none of us have. Yeah, but yeah. you could possibly put it on a level where you know it, it's it's almost a similarity to a high that you get yeah yeah 100 uh, taking like that and it's also because of the the especially i don't know how far you've progressed within the stand-up world um 
but when you start to do more serious gigs mm -hmm. and you do well, like that well, is... Well, I've never done well. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I knew we'd get along well. <laughs> I knew we'd get along. No, when you do like, so like I, I start, I've, I've started like progressing like yeah. uh, in, the, in the comedy store and that's like, you know, that's a huge institution in the UK still. Mm -hmm. And um, you ha you can't mess up because they'll happily you know downgrade your slot or give yeah. you a booking in a few months. So the pressure feels high. Yeah. And to like to do well at that gig or even like a bigger club, you know, when you start to get like a hundred, two hundred plus people yeah. in a room, and you start to like do well, and you just feel that that heat and that energy, and you just feel in control of it. Hello. Oh, I love the doggy. <laughs> There's um, so many dogs coming to visit us. Um, when you feel that, like it's just oh man, yeah. that is that is wicked. Yeah, it's, it's an, good. It's an incredible feeling because you you get that instantaneous response yeah. that you don't get yeah. with and you feel so liked oh, right exactly you feel like people actually like, like you for once yeah all you those spend the rest of your day it's like all those like school loser. days when you're yeah. a loser they don't matter anymore <laughs> yeah. you can forget yeah, about yeah, them yeah, yeah. Oh, i said too much uh, but yeah that that kind of instantaneous response i yeah. think um has a has a real potency when yeah. you write something you never know yeah, yeah. if someone's gonna have a reaction to it yeah. or you know you do a radio show a podcast or something or even a tv show you don't really know yeah but when you're performing like a musician or a comedian yeah. you know yeah, yeah right yeah. if you mess up you can tell yeah but equally if you do well you can tell as well yeah, you get yeah, a response, yeah, yeah. right and it's like i'm sort of obviously i'm still a relatively new act like four or five years in but mm. you know i get moments where i think like I don't, I know it doesn't happen all the time, but I just think, oh, I did a really smart choice there. Mm -hmm. Or I really let that pause for a minute. I really like held that for the right moment and I yeah. switched it. And then that feels, yeah, that feels good. Yeah. But, but stuff like that, when you have like, when you, you know, when, when people say, when you crush, like, that's the American <laughs> accent. Yo, know, dude, this guy crushed, bro. <laughs> he crushed, man. But when you do, when you get that feeling, you know, that's like, I've had a few yeah. of those uh, uh, so far. And um, it's like, wow. It's like, oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. And, it's it's exactly and it's that it's that response you know if you've written something good yeah. people are laughing at it yeah but then do you but, also but, do you also have those moments where you think well actually i'm really annoyed because this bit is very very good and it's not getting yeah, yeah, the yeah, reception yeah, 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 it deserves yeah, yeah. of course so i just tend to shout at the audience and talk, call them all pedophiles that's what i do <laughs> classic classic comedian move um they no, must love that. no so i think it's you know with those ones you really feel it out because sometimes i think also a lot of like especially when you start out you think why aren't they laughing and stuff like this but yeah. a lot of times audiences you know they just want to chill so you can mm. do like i mean it's, i'm sure a lot of comedians have said this before sometimes you'll do like a 20 minute set and it'll be like tepid laughter and um uh then you go off and then the audience goes oh man i really enjoyed that and i said and then you'd be like oh but you guys weren't really laughing a lot and they get yeah we're just a bit tired so we just wanted to really enjoy because that's how people are sometimes mm. i mean obviously but there, there are like i think it's there's a difference between you know you don't want that of course you really want like proper mm. laughter mm. but there's a difference between people not enjoying it and people not paying attention yeah and there's also different atmospheres as well yeah yeah, yeah have you ever been to a tv show uh, or you know uh, kind of comedy maybe a comedy TV show where you have that warm up guy yeah, yeah. and the warm up guy whips the audience into a frenzy yeah. and he says you know if you're not laughing you're going to have to come up here yeah. and tell jokes and so whatever is said the audience go into hysterics yeah, yeah, yeah. you see that on a lot of American shows yeah, yeah, yeah. you can just walk out and be like hi <laughs> like, yeah, the audience yeah. Is just, oh yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> Yeah, they just. Yeah. I find wild. when I see sometimes when I see clips that come from the U.S., like of the audiences mm. there, I think, damn, they really enjoy it. Like, yeah. but it's good because it's not like it's not like the comedy's bad either. It's like mm. the comedy's great, but they're like laugh and they're really getting into it. Yeah. And then sometimes you see like British audiences and you just think you guys are such miserable twats. Sometimes, <laughs> not always. I love I love gigging here in the U.K. It's really fun, but there are some times where you just think, oh man, like yeah. like it just feels like there's a different energy. But it's every room is different, every gig is different, so. Yeah, it's just really enjoyable. Well, you, you've done a lot of um, gigs abroad as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any yeah. Uh, terrible locations? Terrible locations. You're never going to play at again. No, no, I don't think any place has been that bad that has written me off a, like a nationality or culture. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, I gig a lot in Europe, which I really enjoy. Yeah. Because um, I, I, I didn't I should have explained at the start for anybody listening in to explain my accent. So my mom is Slovenian-American, and then my dad was Austrian, and then I went to international school in Slovenia, so that's why... Very Habsburg. Very, very Habsburg, yes, very Habsburg. That's a funny way to phrase it, <laughs> minus the American. But um, yeah, yeah, that's funny, man. That's good. I like that. Um, not you many can have that one for free. I'm not going to use it on a stage because everyone's going to be like, who the fuck Habsburgs? <laughs> <laughs> um, what? Habsburgs? Um, but uh, yeah, 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 very, very much so. And um, 
yeah oh man look at this dog it's like magical yeah um, the um you do see some dogs there's a lot of cute dogs here there was a dog i saw once and i was with a friend and i said that doesn't even look like a people dog <laughs> and then they were like what and i'm like I'm like you know like that doesn't look like a dog a human being would own that looks like some sort of mythical creature right you see those dogs every once in a while you just think like they're you, like ha you have to show me a photo of that later because I, mean, I can't really yeah, yeah, like a a I'll show you a photo of a dragon yeah. <laughs> uh, no I mean there's just like there's some things in the world that are yeah. just so amazingly beautiful um, well, you were saying about your family as well that my family is so beautiful yeah yeah, yeah that's my point um, <laughs> anyway I'll stop with that really sincere point about beauty and God um, <laughs> I'm talking about my family I don't even remember what I was saying yeah we were talking about yeah, gigging, so gigging, like, around gigging around Europe gigging around Europe yeah because yeah. yeah, so, so I grew up mainly in Europe and yeah. so I like I like like gigging there it feels a bit more uh, at home than yeah, it's great. Like the English speaking comedy scene in Europe is really exploding. There's tons of like expats, immigrants and all sorts like of in stuff. Berlin, and stuff. Berlin yeah. uh, I think it was in Estonia. And also there's a lot of places where, yeah. you know, people, everyone speaks English, not everyone, but a lot of people speak English. And so you get like people who are going there to improve their English. Sometimes yeah. it's couples whose mutual language is English. Sometimes it's like Brits and Americans abroad. Um, so it's just a, and it's really fun because it's sort of, it is the ultimate power of comedy, which is joining people together. Um, in a community and they're all laughing at the same thing and it, that feels like that feels pretty incredible do you do location specific jokes like were you writing some Tallinn jokes yeah. when you were in Estonia um, no I, I do it every once in a while so for Amsterdam I found it very easy to do that because I'd been there once before and also I think the Dutch are quite an easy audience to make fun of because they're inherently I mean they're, they're former colonial power there's this high status to it they're also very weird people yeah. um, if you're Dutch listening I'm sorry, sorry. To, to tell you uh, <laughs> You were you like writing your stroop waffle yeah, yeah, yeah. gags. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had no, I that one that I did, which was oh sirens, oh, oh it's the comedy police, too edgy. Um, no, I hate that shit. Whenever I watch that's a comedian, because of the, the uh, yeah, 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 the one thing, you might edit out. The thing that's going to be edited out. Yeah, People yeah, yeah. will be like, what's that thing that they edited out? Um, uh, the um, no, so I had one a bit I did there, which was about like the type of men who go to the red light district. Yeah. Um, and I basically just. There was a very physical joke of it where I acted out. Like, I basically, the second, for some reason, the second you walk into the red light district, the quality are you, are of men. Are you about to tell me that you got your, what? you said it's a physical joke yeah. about the red light district. Did you get out a part of your body? No, 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 no. <laughs> it's more that, like, I don't know why, but you walk into the red light district and it's just the tourists who go there are just like, it's just, you know... Some of them are like, you know, it's everyday normal people. Then you do get these men who just like, they just look mm. uncomfortable yeah. to be around. And, and it, I'm it's not, it's, weird it's, and so the whole bit was really making fun of them. And I sort of like do yeah. this whole act out where I like transform into like this non-human. I had a couple of other ones. Uh, one of them was like, it was a really stupid joke, but it was like, I went to a shop called Cheese and More. It's just more cheese. <laughs> just more cheese. So much cheese. Um, so stuff like that is fun. And then there's yeah. a both. Also in Amsterdam, they do this weird thing where, like when you ask them to fill up your water bottle, you, they fill up a glass of water for you. They they have like these baths by the, the the sink in a coffee shop will just be full of water constantly running, and that's how they wash it because they just sink it in there and they wash it. It's really weird, mm. but so when you ask them to fill up their, their water bottle, they'll take the water bottle and they'll dunk it under the whole bath, and just so that the tap. I don't know if this makes clear. If, if, if this makes yeah. clear, if this is making sense, basically the the tap is right next to the water bath, and so they have to sink the whole bottle underneath so the water can go in and then they take it out and so they hand you back this bottle that's drenched in water and they look at you like that's normal <laughs> like they haven't just like baptized your water bottle and handed it back to you so this they location do have, they do have, yeah they do have some funny quirks there don't yeah they? so stuff like that i'll do those location specific jokes um Fibo jokes Fibo. did you ever go there no it's like uh this takeaway where there are these um Oh, is it like boxes. with the boxes and yeah, you open it up? Yeah, exactly. Stuff. You yeah, put like yeah, a euro yeah. in yeah. and get a cheese croquette out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah very yeah. strange. That is Never strange. But like, I understand the practicality of that. That's yeah. that's just stuff like that. But yeah, I, lo I, lo I love it a lot. I think it's really fun. Also, it's kind of like free holiday. So, yeah. And that. But it does, it, it is it is tiring at times, especially because I do like early flights usually to save money. And I have to like, I work a nine to five while I do all this as well. So it becomes like, it just becomes a lot. So that's the mm. biggest thing I think I find really challenging about being a, like a touring comedian who ha I have no agent, I have no like, you know, I have no, no, no manager or anything like that. It's all just me putting this all together. Um, and so just, it's just a lot. So yeah. that's why I'm really trying to make this, I, I, for me, this Edinburgh show is really my chance to hopefully prove myself in a way that I haven't before. 
and hopefully get a bit of you know more industry stuff or maybe some yeah. just more gigs it's like there's a lot riding on me for this to go well but it's not everything yeah. because that's one of the benefits i think as well and this is probably advice for any career path which is that if you diversify your options so like you know if the edinburgh doesn't go well i can still do club gigs if they don't go well i still have europe if your doesn't go well i still have edinburgh you know i always have other options there yeah. i'm a hustler baby I'm, I'm i'm a grinder and that's why i think women should take a chance on men who are failing because <laughs> we're hustle we thrive you know one, yeah. of the, one of the jokes i have in it is i say it, you know you, you're dating this guy he's got what a, a car and a steady income i've got a bicycle and a dream and <laughs> i'm gonna ride that little thing to the top so i'm very much in this stage of my career but i'm still 25 and young yeah. but it's fun to like i'm just always like hustling i'm always trying to like just get this going and get that going yeah. and for you know take all the different routes i, I, I can. completely empathize with that philip i'm i'm uh, there's, you know, I knew was, it. I saw a fellow you, hustler. I could tell. Well, we, game was, recognized game. <laughs> it was funny. We, we both arrived like on our bikes. Yeah. We just like there's a kind of like shady glamour to that. Yeah. yeah, in yeah. Itself. Your but bike look, was nice though. Thank you. I've uh, had it since I was 12 years old. Oh wow. It's uh, been with me a long time. Nice. Yeah. Wow. It's, uh, you. Yeah. It's, yeah it's, so this book career is going well, isn't it? <laughs> it's lasted a long time. But no, I've I've never had an agent for anything either. Yeah. yeah. I've always been doing these things myself and. I sometimes think maybe I should be paying someone to do all this stuff because yeah, yeah. it's kind of annoying. Yeah, yeah. Like all the admin and everything. 100%. But at the same time, I think I've got so used to doing it all now. Yeah. It's kind of like second nature. Yeah. And there are some people who can't book their own flights. Yeah. They're just incapable of it. Yeah. And they can't do, you know, accounts yeah. and stuff like that. So and I've kind of learned to do all that 100%. shit. 100%. I think that's one of the biggest things. And I think I know this about comedy and this is one of the advantages because I've never really had, I've had some, you know, people in the industry been interested in me, mm. which is, you know, great when that's happened and it's been exciting. But because I've had to do a lot of this by myself, it kind of means that even when I am hopefully in a position where someone can help me out in some ways, um, that I will just have, I'll just be able to do a lot of it myself, that I'm not as dependent on it. Mm. And I think that's one of the biggest things that like, you know, I don't know how it is with other creative spheres and other industries but you know not being successful earlier on or like compared to some of my peers who I started out with for certain I'm not as successful in some ways because it's just literally just means people take a chance on you and just not the right people have which is fine but plenty of the right people have as well so I've progressed in ways that they haven't and they've progressed in ways I haven't um is just that you learn to do it yourself and that can be really satisfying and that it means that when you finally do get the weight taken off of you like a few of the, you know if I just had like a few more people like if I didn't have to invoice if I didn't have to do this I didn't have to do this just extra few things or follow up on emails yeah then it's chasing, just, invoices, chasing invo so invoices and then you just free up that time and then you realize oh I can do this I can do so much yeah, more now yeah. with this time I have yeah. but if that doesn't happen I'm still gonna try like that's the thing it's like yeah don't give up you just gotta keep going yeah it's so important isn't it exactly and any kind of creative endeavor you do face a lot of hurdles yeah you need to be strong and determined yeah yeah, yeah. grit and keep yeah grit. You, have to, you have to keep on going you have to keep on going i know a lot of people in acting comedy music people who've found it tough and then have basically chosen not to continue that and become, given up was the word you're looking was, for you, was, you liberal snowflake too scared to say it i was thinking about giving up. i was thinking of my friends i was like i don't want to insult yeah. you but like it's fine no, like, no, no, no. i understand it but yeah, also people, sometimes like, external pressure a happen. teacher or you know they become or sometimes like their family gets in the way and stuff like that right, so you gotta you gotta, you gotta you cut gotta toxic kill, people out of your life you yeah. just gotta kill them yeah, exactly. and plus you get an edinburgh show out yeah, exactly and uh, one final thing i wanted to ask you philip um i i sometimes wonder about this idea of like the outsider's eye right mm -hmm. i sometimes think maybe the funniest thing is if you're coming from a, a different yeah, place right yeah so you know what i'm talking about like you can have you can see the absurdity yeah and i think you know when i i spent probably the first 20 years of my life almost every day in britain yeah. and britain to me seemed normal yeah and then i started traveling and realized it's a very very strange yeah place mm. that's not like the rest of Europe or like yeah. anywhere else and actually having that outside of viewpoint maybe uh, helps you to see the absurdity and to see the comedy and stuff right do you yeah. think it's important to have that that kind of um, yeah I think it's sort of I don't know it can be an outsider eye can be beneficial but it can also be damaging because there's sometimes there's a relatability that's required in comedy and so somebody having the insider perspective I think it's, I think people who are able to be within this, I always find those people are really fascinating to me. People who can live in two worlds. I find mm -hmm. those people really interesting to me. So I think of more, 
you know, I have like friends of mine who come from like a very like you know working class background, or like what we'd you know, or, well, yeah, let's say that as an example. Um, and then, but now they work in like like very like historic wealthy like industries. So let's say like you know, um, yeah, people would understand that. And so I find them interesting in that they can interact in both of those worlds and and and, and appeal to both of that. And mm -hmm. they can I don't really know what my point was there. It was more that they sort of they can be within that world, but still have that outsider perspective, so they can relate to it. Mm -hmm. But because they're a little bit outside of it, they can poke fun at it through yeah. it's almost through relating to it. Whereas I feel myself, because I was like, you know, my parents separated when I was young, so I was never really felt like I fell into the traditional family structure. Um, and then I'm Austrian American Slovenian, so I'm not really from anywhere. Um, I'm like technically a man, only in that I identify as a man, and I was <laughs> I have male genitalia, or you know, but I've never super felt manly in this world. But I also don't feel. I don't feel like, you know, like a, like a pushover. I don't feel like I'm... So I feel like I'm sensitive and I let things feel me, which I don't think are traditional manly things, but I still, like, I still hate myself for it. So it's a really bizarre, <laughs> it's a really bizarre dynamic there. Well, I think, that, I think that's true of yeah. most comedians. Yeah, 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 yeah. We all feel things and we hate ourselves yeah. for it. So I think an outsider perspective is really good. Yeah. And you can cultivate that as well. You can sort of try to think about where do you feel lost in the world or where do you feel out of place? Um, yeah, I think it's 100 percent good because it just sort of you're just seeing something that no one else is seeing because, well, inherently every person, as long as you take the second to think, what am I actually doing in my life? What is actually happening around me? That'll that'll pull you out of it. And just pulling yourself out of yourself is an outsider perspective. Yeah. So yeah, it's hugely it's hugely beneficial. Um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't really know if that's the big you know take home message I want to give, but I 100 percent think that I've I've always felt like a bit lost in this world. Um, and it's it's kind of a sadness and a loneliness that is kind of like like I've only started to address recently mm. um, how I felt it. But you know, I talked to my mother and she said I've always felt that way about myself. And I talked to other people and like I think it I think that kind of a feeling a lot of people feel lost mm. because w why should you feel kind of in place? You know, yeah. like like it's so complex the world mm. we live in that if you did feel in place, you'd be I, I'd actually I judge you more. Yeah, I judge you. I think you're weird if you feel at home yeah. given what's happening. I think it's really cool to say what you just said as well, and I think it's great that these days people feel, yeah. and men feel like more able to yeah, yeah. express those things yeah, that yeah. may be. We need to talk about men's mental health. Yeah, I don't think anybody's pretty, talking. No, no, but like, like seriously, I, whenever I've been to a funeral, if my family from Yorkshire, yeah. I, no one cries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone just talks about parking and stuff. Course, I love it. It's ridiculous. I love that. It's good. It's good to express these things. Yeah. So when you were to, when you were just saying that to me, I was like. Hmm, I wonder if a graveyard is the best place to bring you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but thank you for your candor anyway. No, no, I'm not. Um, well, we'll, we'll, fi we'll finish off now, Philip, but tell me what your um, next steps are. Obviously, Edinburgh. Yeah. And then, um, do you have any plans after that? Any yeah, gigs, yeah, I do. So, stuff? you know, get shredded for the for next summer. Get ripped. Uh, <laughs> Love Island. Love Island. I think Love that's what my career is. Yeah. Love Island 24. Yeah. That's what the career is taking me. Yeah. No, so I'm doing Edinburgh for the month of August. Um, and then I'm going away to the States for the month of September. Uh, so I'm there for the month. And then in, when I come back in cool. October, I'll be filming the show uh, October uh, 19th. Uh, West End Comedy Club is where it should be at unless anything changes. And uh, yeah, so that'll be filming the show and then I'll use that and then I'll release it like kind of on my, on my website to buy and then probably release it on YouTube a few months later and um, then just have those as little clips to upload and yeah, just sort of get a lot of this material out of the way. Um, I'm a bit nervous about filming it because it kind of like, it means that I can't do that material anymore. I can't develop it anymore. So I really have to make sure it's good by then. But I'm just incredibly excited for the show to do it in Edinburgh because I just think it's so fun. And I know that when people watch, I don't want to sound too arrogant because of I just fucking told you the US passport thing, but, <laughs> but genuinely the feedback I've gotten from the show, a lot of people find it like really refreshing and fun and interesting. It's not very serious, it's very silly, it's like very physical, but it's also like got a bit of heart and a bit of edge to it. So I think it's kind of everything I love about comedy I'm trying to put out on there. Perfect. Um, so yeah. Philip Kostoleski, thank you so much. I hope no you've worries. enjoyed today. My pleasure, I'll shake your hand. Wonderful, well, should I say where the show is at? Yes. The right. Edinburgh Fringe, stand to 4 p.m. Perfect. Cheers, Philip. All right. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. Thanks, Dan. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Park Date. Um, there's lots more where that came from, and there'll be more in the future as well. If you enjoyed it, please leave a review, um, good or bad, make them funny, I'll be reading out the best ones and there'll be a prize for the one that makes me laugh the most. 
name check some trees in your reviews and leave them wherever you get your podcast from check out our website parkdate.co.uk and um, if you see me walking around in the park come and say hello I think that was the sound of someone sneezing um, yes thank you bye bye hmm coming up next time on part date I'm going to give you a lowdown on this restaurant that I'm in I've never been anywhere like this in my life hmm basically I'm just eating um cats and who would have thought they could be so tasty oh full story on the next part date see ya